Hi, my name is Dr. Talia Kansalau. Um, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity. Um, before I begin, can you see my video? Can you see the presentation? Yes, thank you. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, 300 million people globally suffer from major depression and every 80 seconds, one of these individuals takes their own lives. We urgently need to change these statistics. My name is Dr. Talia Cohen Salal. I'm the CEO and co founder of Genetica Plus. I spent more than a decade of academic research across Oxford, UCL, and Columbia universities looking at the underlying causes of mental illness. And I'm joined by my co founder, Dr. Daphne Leifenfeld, also a PhD in depression, junior faculty at Harvard, and most recently the head of precision medicine at Teva Pharmaceuticals. Nadav Askari, our CTO, who spent more than 10 years at Merck and brought more than 120 products to the market, and Josh Schulman, our SVP of Partnerships and Innovation, who's brought CE approval and FDA designation to companies he represented. We also have an amazing team of scientists and product and scientific advisors, including Jeff Bush, who's brought products like ours to reimbursement in the US, and Rizio Fava, the director of psychiatry from Harvard University. So how are we solving the problem of major depression? Well, when treating a patient with depression, the physician must choose from one of over 70 different medications. And as each medication takes four to six weeks to test, the patient loses months to years of their lives or even their lives searching for the right treatment. At Genetica Plus, we're matching the right drug to the right patient from the start. And take this period, taking this period of trial and error testing out of the patient and into the lab where it belongs. We take a simple blood draw, which combines the patient's genetics, their patient history from a questionnaire, and their unique neurobiology to create a personalized recommendation to the physician for the right medication. So what is that unique neurobiology? From that blood sample, we use stem cell technology to generate a brain in the dish for each patient. And we're able to screen those brains in a dish for all the different antidepressants to see which antidepressant has the strongest impact on that patient's unique model, allowing us to make the most accurate treatment recommendation today. At the end of the day, the physician has a simple portal or a PDF through which to make the recommendation um, and to help their patients get better faster, saving patient lives, saving physicians time and saving payers cost. So who else is out there? Well, I'm glad to say we're not the only ones in this market because changing physician behavior is a tough thing to do. There are, is a new technology called pharmacogenetics, which has been around for a couple of years, which uses just the patient genetics to predict which antidepressant the patient should use. But this is limited because pharmacogenetics only tells you whether the drug is gonna make it past the liver to the brain and not what it's gonna do in the brain itself, which our unique neurobiological model does. As a result, their clinical trials have only shown 15% success rates, whereas our early data shows that Genetica Plus can predict with up to 73% accuracy as to which drug the patient will respond to. Nonetheless, our competitors have already sold over a million tests and generated over $130 million of gross annual revenues, showing the product market fit and the desperation in this market for technologies that change the way physicians are able to treat patients and bring physician, precision medicine into the mental health space. This type of test alone represents a total addressable market of $6 billion in the United States alone. But we've developed a platform that's much bigger than that. We've developed a precision medicine for the brain platform, and we can rapidly add additional indications, firstly in the psychiatric space, and eventually, as there are multiple drugs to choose from, as multiple drugs to choose from become available in the neurological space, representing up to a hundred billion dollar global total addressable market. FDA, these FDA is not required for this type of technology. It's an LDT, and so it just requires CREA approval. Reimbursement codes already exist thanks to our competitive technology. And so we have an easier path to market than most. Since we opened the company in 2018, we've raised a VC backed seed and seed plus round, completed our uh, clinical, early clinical trials with the NIH, and had two patents and a publication um, for Genetica Plus. 
Our next steps are expanded clinical trials with Jefferson in Philadelphia and Sheba Hospital here in Israel, partnerships and pilots to test our product in the market and scale up for our early market entry, for our market entry to the US. I urge you to join Genetica Plus in our battle to fight depression head on. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for your presentation, Talia. No problem. Oh, Talia? Yeah, thank you. Go ahead. Have, have you been able, so, sorry, Ray. Yeah, it's fine. Go ahead. Uh, have you been able to already have some result in the capabilities to change and to uh, skill up the result in analysis of depressions? So uh, see that you're already in the market, that's fine. But, uh, no, uh, we're not in the market, but we have had um, some early results using a retrospective clinical trial approach. So we took patient samples from patients who'd completed an, a clinical trial. We knew whether they were responders or non-responders. Um, but we were obviously blinded when we ran our retrospective clinical trial approach. We ran these samples through our brain in a dish screen, and we were able to see, and we were able to see a clear indication whether the whether the patient was a responder or a non-responder. And we were able to demonstrate this across three different classes of drugs and across three different groups of patients. Um, and so some of that data is in our publication in the peer-reviewed journal um, by Nature Publications Translational Psychiatry, um, and some of that is in our two patents that we filed. And so first I'm of all, to go forward into new, new cohorts. First of all, congratulations on addressing this area. This is an important global topic, and it's gotten worse over the last year and a half, as you know. Uh, so it's a, it's a great area. When do you think the next stage, to, to follow on from Eduardo's question, when do you think the next stage of, uh, of efficacy proof will happen? Um, so yeah, we're already um, initiating these two trials, one in the US and one here in Israel, to expand uh -huh. our patient cohort. So that will show that we can demonstrate this in different groups of patients. Right. Um, and our prediction um, validity in distinct cat into distinct kind of backgrounds and distinct collection methods. Um, and then we'll be going into pilot studies where we can start to actually also collect some of that economic data to accompany this to show how we are both saving lives and reducing payer can you, costs. Can, can you give me notional dates for those two timelines? Um, so we'll be completed with Jefferson and Sheba within a year um, and the pilots we want to start within a year. And we want to enter, and we call the pilots like a soft launch as well, um, and you a bit more user testing and understanding the physician's journey. Um, but our real market entry, we hope for, uh, we are aiming for 2023, the middle of 2023. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Talia, thank you for the presentation. Really, really impressive what you've done so far. Um, quick question about the brain in a dish, because it appears to me that that's really maybe the biggest moat that you can build in terms of your competitive differentiation. And correct me if I'm wrong on that one, but at, at a very high level, how does a brain in a dish work? Right. Um, so that was what I spent about five years kind of developing some of the leading technologies at Columbia. That's not where the patents, the patents are about utilization of that brain in a dish and the biomarkers we've created, just to clarify. Um, but basically what we do is we use the advent of um, human induced pluripotent stem cells so the fact that we can take any sample from, from a human body, which has a nucleus, so a blood cell is fine, we can turn it into a stem cell, which has the ability to become any type of cell, and then we push it down to being a neuron. We don't just put it to, push it to being a neuron, we in, push it to being a neuron in the frontal brain, uh, frontal cortex, and that's the area most affected in depression. So what we then have is, a, is an in vitro model of the patient's brain. And you know, typically you could only practice great precision medicine in spaces like cancer where you had a biopsy to test or, or understand or explore. And now what we're using HIPSC technology, this stem cell derived brains in a dish, um, we're using it to practice precision medicine in a previously inaccessible tissue. So once we have these neurons, we can put them into many, many different wells. We put them onto 94, 96 and soon 384 well plates. All the different drugs can be put in different wells, and then we get a ranking of which medication has the best rescue effect using biomarkers that um, we've patented, um, and also biomarkers which are kind of 
um, also uh, logically driven by mecha the mechanistic underpinnings of major depression. Okay, so so this in vitro response by the by the neurons is that a very good representation of what we would see in the actual frontal cortex? And uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so some of the reasons that we that I can say absolutely um, are because um, first of all, if we go back to both mine and other works um, across many universities across the world, um, I was building these models, brains in a dish, which turned out to mimic the patients that we had. Um, unfortunately, that we have some post-mortem brain tissue, animal model studies as well, and that's been seen in a variety of different brain disorders, um, autism, schizophrenia, depression, and we can kind of trace them from the brain in a dish to the real humans and see those parallels. And then the second thing is from our, clinic, our clinical data, Genetica Pluses, um, we see that in patients who responded to medication in real life, we can see them responding to medication in the dish. And that's really the ultimate validation. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Talia, for your presentation and your time today. No problem, thank you all. Thank you. Hillridge builds technology to address the climate protection gap. Weather insurance, can take weeks, weeks and cost thousands to arrange. Our platform does it in seconds, providing farmers with easy access to meaningful weather risk tools. And we launched just last week with Mitsui Sumitomo Insurance and Marsh, the world's largest insurance broker. I'm Dale Schilling, CEO and co-founder of Hillridge. Growing up in a farming family, I learned firsthand how catastrophic extreme weather can be and how droughts frost, heat stress, or too much rain at the wrong time can devastate farmers like my dad. Farming has always been risky, and the weather drives so much income volatility for farmers, but it's getting worse with climate change, yet local insurers only offer low-value fire and hail cover. Corporate agribusinesses use derivatives to manage this risk, but small and medium-sized farms can't, and it's that gap that lack of financial tools to manage weather risks, that's a problem shared by hundreds of millions of farmers around the world. The insurance industry calls it the climate protection gap. It's a $70 billion problem and a $5 billion opportunity for tech companies like Hillridge. Now, this gap is not because of a lack of data, nor is it because of a lack of demand. The fact is local insurers simply cannot risk their business by accumulating more local weather perils. So Hillridge has been working with large global insurers interested in agriculture to spread their risks. Our digital platform helps farmers buy weather index insurance to protect against drought, low temperatures, heat stress, or too much rain. And it's different from the traditional insurance you may be familiar with. It's parametric based on weather readings like temperature or rainfall. It's based on algorithms, not judgment calls. The end-to-end -end process is automated. And because it's automated, the variable cost for each policy is negligible, reducing the minimum contract size by two orders of magnitude. Farmers get a quote online in seconds, and once they buy, they're covered. If that weather event occurs, the farmer's payout is fixed, fast, and guaranteed. It's a game changer for our insurance partners too. Our digital platform provides automated pricing, risk management, portfolio management, and settlement services. It speeds up the time to market for new parametric insurance products. It opens up new market segments, small and medium sized farming businesses in the developed world and small hold farmers in emerging markets. And it gives underwriters greater geographic spread to diversify the returns in their portfolio. So how does Hillridge make money? We license our technology to the insurer, who in turn pays us a percentage of premium revenues. We signed with trial partners last year and generated $50,000 in revenue to Hillridge. And last week, we launched a weather index insurance platform with the backing of Mitsui Sumitomo Insurance, Marsh and Nutrien, a global farming supplier. Having launched in Australia, we're now raising our seed round. 
and plan to use the funds to expand internationally in unserved and underserved markets, whether it's in risk management, fintech, agronomy or engineering, we have the right team to make it happen. By 2040, climate change means that catastrophic weather will hit our farms at more than double the rate of today. Let's give farmers the tools they need to manage their weather risks. And with that, greater peace of mind and financial resilience for them and the communities they live and work in. Thank you. Thank you, Dale uh, from the Hill Ridge. And now I'm gonna open up the floor for judges Q and A. Do you wanna take down your slide, Dale? Great. Perfect, thank you. If you don't mind, I'd go first. Um, Dale, can you just talk us through very simply what your go-to-market strategy is? How you're planning to broaden the base of farmers that you take the product out? Yeah, so our go-to-market strategy is to uh, is to deliver this product um, through existing partners that already have a relationship with farmers. So in Australia, for example, that's Nutrien. They're a farming supply company that supplies around half of the broadacre crop farmers here in Australia. Um, they also operate in Canada, the US and Argentina, and so will naturally grow uh, in countries where they're strong and look for corporate partners that have that existing relationship uh, with, with farmers in those countries. Very helpful, thank you. Thank you, Vinay. Any other questions? Yes, I also have a question. Uh, so I imagine that small and medium-sized farmers, especially those that are first-time farmers, might not have the resources to get a lot of different types of insurances, and they might prioritize uh, some other types of insurances that are more common in the market. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you make sure that they don't have this trade-off effect? Have you thought about bundling or cross-selling with other types of products? Yeah, that, that's right. So with our corporate partners, Nutrien, for example, offers working capital loans to farmers. And as part of our go-to-market strategy, we've ensured um, that the insurance premium can be bundled into those existing working capital loans. You know, it's really important for farmers because typically they receive cash flow once, twice. maybe twice a year. Uh, so was whether do you have thought about bundling uh, or cross-selling with other types of insurances where uh, farmers might uh, not face that trade-off option between, you know, insurances that they are already working with um, and yours? Yeah, so we're, we're, we're partnering with Marsh and uh, who already offers uh, existing insurance, so that traditional crop insurance. This um, partners quite well with that, so uh, it can be bundled together with that. Um, but the value add for us was in extending that risk profile for the insurer as well as for the farmer. You know, that, that's the piece that's missing in the market today. Great, thank you. Any other questions? I do have one more if possible. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't completely sure if this insurance model is based on one-off premiums or if it's a recurring premium insurance. Yeah, so it's, um, it's one-off per season. So typically the farmer will take this out at critical points in the agronomic cycle um, per crop season, but then it would be a repeat purchase, uh, you know, the, the following season when they plant. So for example, they might be worried about emergence risk, you know, drought risk um, when the seedlings emerge, they might be worried about spring radiation frosts or heat stress, or they might be worried about too much rain just before harvest. And so they can take out insurance for those specific agronomic points and they can repeat that purchase uh, each crop cycle. How did you make sure then there is retention year over year? Uh, so we've only just launched. This is our first year. Um, uh, we'll look at uh, retention policies uh, from, uh, you know, from, from next year onwards, but it's certainly something we've got our eye on. Thank you. Uh, Victoria, do we have time for one additional question? Uh, sure, go ahead, Louise, please. Hello, Dale. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, just a uh, for me to understand, uh, maybe you touched that a little bit during your presentation. What's the financial impact for the farmers? Meaning how much mm -hmm. can they save with your product and service uh, when compared to traditional insurances? If they were to claim, does that mean that uh, one of these potential high risks would 
basically wipe out their production. And so they really need to have this type of insurances. Yeah, that, that's exactly the point. So a catastrophic drought um, can end a farmer's career, um, you know, in quite an ignominious way. And so what this insurance does is it, it protects farmers against those catastrophic downsides that can really blindside them. So that means that with this insurance, they can take, uh, they can take more investment, they can take more risks. What farmers are telling us is that with this kind of insurance, um, they're willing to invest in more fertiliser, for example, and they end up producing more. Um, the, uh, the University of California, Berkeley did a study over in West Africa, and they found that with this kind of insurance, um, that farmers, uh, on, on a pilot basis, farmers produced up to 20% more because they were able to invest with confidence. And so it's that peace of mind and financial um, security that we're providing them. Okay, that's all the questions we have. Thank you for judges. Let's, let's move Thank on you. to the next uh, presentation. So good morning or good afternoon. My name is Ophir Zukowski and I'm the co-founder of Testmaster. Uh, we created Testmaster, a private tutor app in your pocket in order to ensure that every student in the world can maximize his or her true academic potential. Uh, it was long ago when we heard about XTC that we actually started to deal with the problem. And uh, I would like to show you today what we've come up with. The main challenge today around the world, and not only in Africa, is that there is a global problem, a huge problem for education. Uh, according to the UNESCO reports, we have 69 million teachers missing by the year of 2030, with Sub-Saharan Africa being the highest affected area. In Sub-Saharan Africa, on secondary school alone, we're talking about 17 million missing teachers we're talking about large classes, sometimes more than 100 students per class. We're talking about over 50% of teachers that are unqualified in terms of skill sets. When we actually researched in Nigeria, which is our first market, we found cases with teachers of seven and eight years of education teaching in schools. And there's also a huge phenomenon of over 25% of teacher absenteeism. So this is a huge huge world problem. Why do we care? If there's a number that I want you to keep in your mind is that uh, according to the UNICEF report, by 2050, 40% of the children under the age of five are originated from Africa. Our first market in Nigeria, we see that today only 62% Nigerian children are uh, not completing uh, high school camps are not opening their doors to academic uh, education. Uh, some of you, of course, are related to education. Everybody remembers the vision of uh, Professor Nicolas Negroponte of the computer uh, for every child for $100. And what I would like to tell you today is that the time is right. And when we built Testmaster, this was one of the main uh, drivers uh, to our solution. If we look today at the prices of smartphones, we see that in Africa, they actually use, you know, uh, Android smartphone in a cost of around $50. And this is already fulfilling the need of having a computer device in every child, with every child. What we actually did is very simple. We took a video, which is today the main medium, uh, a rich uh, media uh, medium, and we have modeled uh, all of the content of K-12 education uh, for uh, mid-school and high school in Nigeria. And we modeled all the content into 15,000 learning objects. All of them solved step-by-step -step videos in a Khan Academy type of solution and presented in a very simple to use mobile app, what we call a private tutor in your pocket. Our students who actually use the system call it the teacher that never sleeps. It's very simple and intuitive to actually work with. So for example, if I'm selecting uh, physics, I'm presented with a series of questions in different topics. When I'm solving the solution and I'm selecting an answer, 
I get an immediate feedback whether I'm right or wrong. If I'm wrong, I have the ability with a click of a button to watch a full step-by-step -step ex explanation by the best teachers in Nigeria. We've done all of that with local teams that work with us in Nigeria. And then I get the private tutor experience and I get a full step-by-step -step explanation that I can watch as much as I want. It's available for me based on my knowledge and available 24 seven without me leaving my home. We're also looking at providing an affordable solution that can be in the hands of the masses. So our solution, we provide a full year subscription at a cost of 5% of what would cost a private tutor in Nigeria. And also at around the 10th of what would cost a tutorial center. We've conducted the pilot uh, among schools because we also have a B2G model. We work towards uh, uh, signing contracts with local states in Nigeria and in West Africa. And we were able to, to show together in a collaboration with the University of Lagos uh, that in a pilot, the students performed around 25 to 38% better in English and math after running our program for a period of three months. Uh, since our initiation, private tutor in your pocket, a teacher that provides you with a full explanation step-by-step, step, we were able to get over 200,000 downloads, more than 1 million videos watched in Nigeria alone, and we got a rank of 4.5 stars out of five in the Google Play. Uh, in the future, or what we are now working on, is actually taking the application and turning it in, into a, uh, an AI-based tutor bot in a way that in a kind of natural NLP-wise communication, it will be able to communicate over Messenger or over Telegram with students all around the world and provide them with a personalized experience to study math, English, physics, biology, and other subjects. With regards to our team, uh, I myself am a serial entrepreneur in the edtech sector. I previously uh, co-founded a company in the virtual classroom space and sold it to Kaltura, one of the largest media players in the world. And together with me is Ariel, Gerard, Idan from our Israeli team and a lot of other very talented team members that are working with us in Nigeria and helping us uh, both teachers as well as pedagogical guidance as well as customer care and services. So we will continue and continue our journey to solve the global's most uh, extreme challenge. And I think that one of the things I want you to keep in mind is the magnitude and the impact of the solutions we can bring to the market. I've been visiting the schools in Nigeria. I've been visiting the, the, the land itself. And I can tell you that the situation is, is a total collapse of public education systems. And the students that were actually using Testmaster to prepare for their matriculation exam, as well as their college entry exam, have done significantly better. And many of them contact us up until today uh, to give us feedback about how Testmaster actually helped them in an affordable way to prepare for the matriculation exam, got good scores and get into the academy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey. I have a question Sorry. Go ahead. regarding um, the content creation. So you said that you're working with uh, Nigerian teachers who are acting as, as tutors or creating some of this content. Um, yep. How how do you intend to scale that um, beyond Nigeria every time you go into a new market? And Great, great question. So up until today, uh, Catherine, we've actually developed uh, content for the JUM, which is the psychometric test, the college entry exam in Nigeria. Uh, people take around 2 million, 2, 2.5 million students take this exam every year. But we also developed the content for the WIAC and ECHO. BIKE is the West African uh, Education Council. And this is a test that actually uh, is relevant for uh, uh, multiple countries in West Africa. So the curriculum and the level is very much similar. And we focus on Africa. So our goal is to lead the ethics sector in Africa 
and our content can be very much reused across different countries within West Africa, which speaks English. And after that, we have plans to also uh, provide content to uh, East Africa, which is more French-based uh, content. And just to add to that, we've also built the mechanisms around the pedagogical aspect and how to actually create uh, the learning objects. So all the content we have created is our own IP based on a research we did analyzing 20 years of curriculum and tests in Nigeria and in West Africa. And we have a mechanism today that actually knows how to go into a country and provide a full scale content within six months. Hi, I think in one of your slides, you talked about a 10, 10 cents cost of um, user, a user acquisition cost. Um, yeah. Could you comment a little bit on those channels on how you're doing that? And then also what is the lifetime value of these clients? Sure. So, you know, Africa, you know, on one side, uh, it's challenging, but on the other side, really, I mean, the uh, customer acquisition cost, you know, surprised us on the positive side. We were using uh, platforms such as uh, Google, uh, Google Display and Search, as well as SEO. Uh, the JUMP, JUMP is the psychometric test of Nigeria, and it's the third largest uh, word in terms of search capacity in Nigeria. So we were using Google, we were using Facebook in order to reach the audiences. It was done mainly on the digital side. On the B2G side, we are talking today with three different states in Nigeria that actually uh, agreed. I mean, the head of education has agreed to actually adopt the technology and start pilots uh, with test master in schools across the country. And then just on the on the lifetime value of you of so yeah. the lifetime value we saw. We saw many, many, uh, we give the license for, for a period of a year. So we saw a lot of renewals. We saw people in the last round, the test that we did, we actually provided the solution with different price points. So we actually see to the extent of people renewing the license eight times. Some of the users actually used to go into a low entry price and then renewed it again and again and bought the bigger license. So we have a yearly license, and then we uh, even provided a weekly license. It's a freemium model, so you can actually download the app and start using it. The two exercises in each topic are free to watch, so people can actually experience the product. Hey, any others, or we'll move yeah. on? Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. One question is, is uh, do you see your uh, uh, product and services expanding beyond Africa? So as a start from the technology perspective, Chris, we definitely see that because we're building an infrastructure that can scale to different regions, uh, specifically uh, Southeast Asia, India, as well as Africa. But the first market that we want to tackle and actually uh, uh, lead is the African market, it's an untapped market. The reason behind that is that it's a huge market in terms of capacity. If we look at world demographies 20 years forward, we see, for example, Lagos in Nigeria being one of the largest, you know, the largest city in the world. So while population is dropping in the US and Europe, uh, the African markets are growing, uh, 40% of children under the age of five being African. See the problem that they have with collapsing education systems. We look at it as a solution that can mitigate a lot of this risk. And the feedbacks that we get from our end users is amazing. So we've already reached you know, product market fit and we're moving forward. If you were to go beyond Africa, what would be the number one thing you would change either in your execution or product offerings as you address uh, you know, arguably more competitive markets outside of Africa. So we definitely think that there is a huge potential in uh, countries like Vietnam and India, where we're looking at markets with over 100 million uh, people in population. And uh, so our immediate markets are to expand in West Africa with the content that we have. 
to reach an audience of close to 10 million annual potential uh, uh, students. After that, our goal is to go to and, and revisit Vietnam and India. For those two markets, the product itself is very easy to use. We have invested a lot of uh, efforts with uh, usability studies, uh, but the content will have to change. And the market we are addressing is the mass volumes of individuals that only need to have a mobile phone in their hand and we can provide them with the full digital content. Thank you. Okay, any more? Or we should be done. All right. Thank you very much, Ophir, and thank you thank to you very much. Testmaster. They came to us from the XTC Israel competition. Excellent. Hi, everyone. I'm Chris, CEO of Photokite. Uh, we are a 50-person team of autonomous vehicle and aerial robotics experts set out with a mission to help first responders save lives and preserve property. Uh, I'm going to run a quick visual for you guys uh, just to give you kind of a, a clear idea of what we're doing while I talk through it. Um, so our patented technology enables us um, basically to provide intelligent um, drone in a box solutions and do you guys see that video playing no no it's not playing not coming through for you guys okay let's <laughs> see see if we can see if we can fix that really quick is that better we're getting yeah. some images yeah yeah okay Oh, sorry. Sorry for the issues then. Um, okay. Well, uh, so again, our patented technology, we, it enables us to provide an intelligent drone in a box solution that gets installed in the top of fire trucks and public safety vehicles. So that when a firefighter shows up to their scene, they push a single button and our system opens up and deploys itself and flies up to 150 feet in height. Uh, if the video is not coming through clearly, I, I can get, just start to flip through a few visuals as kind of a backup here. Um, so once it's up it, to 150 feet, again, fully autonomously, it starts to provide a helicopter-like view of each response. And from up there, we provide both thermal and regular video down to the ground. And this information helps first responders size up and assess their incidents quickly and safely. So we've already deployed our systems with fire departments like Paris, Milan, New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, and many more. Uh, these customers have used their system on a daily basis to gain that aerial information they need to save lives and keep their team safe. So our current focus markets are European and North American public safety segments. This represents approximately a $12.5 billion market opportunity with very high barriers to entry. And there are a few several or there are several things that we do with our solution to really stand out from the crowd. A few examples are flight time, autonomy, and regulations. So while normal drones can be flown for about 20 or 30 minutes, our active our systems actively use their tether to provide power and fly for over 24 hours. And regulators have also identified our technology's inherent safety benefits, and Photokite is the only system approved by the FAA to be operated by any firefighter or public safety officer without needing a pilot's license. And that's a really, really key thing when it comes to scalable operations. Uh, but most importantly, really, the real benefit to the user is the fact that they gain aerial information without ever piloting the system. It's as autonomous and as simple as it gets. They simply push a button, launch on a tablet, uh, set their altitude and camera angle, and the system takes care of the rest. Now, we've already signed on the world's top two market leaders as distribution partners, both of them early identifiers of our game-changing solution. Oshkosh is one of them. They're the world leader in fire truck manufacturing, and they build our systems directly into the top of their fire trucks, as you can see here. Uh, Axon, right, is, is a world leader um, in 
connected device supply to public safety, and they're providing Photokites as an integrated solutions in their incident response platform. Those partners and 10 more in Europe are really ramping up orders and installa installation base of our product, soon to make this system the most extensively used public safety unmanned system in the world. Now, our customers have really identified um, that uh, that our product roadmap is putting us on track to fully digitalizing the public safety incident scene. So personnel tracking, video analytics, measurement, mapping, and reconstruction, all of these are now possible given our unique solution that's used on a daily basis from that aerial contextual view. So while fire and public safety teams sign on to purchase or lease photokites um, for installation into their vehicles, they all end up signing on to service contracts that build over time with additional software service layer offerings, establishing the Photokite really as a digital data hub at fire and emergency response scenes. And that includes retrofitting into these old fire trucks, into these old public safety vehicles that really don't have that connectivity and compute basis, but it's still a very large installation base. Uh, beyond the life-saving impact that we strive for every day, we're also particularly proud to be part of the XTC cohort because we believe our solution of visualizing and building measurable context to everyday first responders will also bring added accountability to sectors like law enforcement and police markets. Body cameras and dash cameras have started to tell part of the story, but an overhead and fully contextual video record of each incident really helps ensure that evidence lockers are complete. And we're, we're quite excited about that as a team. Uh, we're currently supported by an incredible investor base, including Credit Suisse, Sony, Qualcomm, uh, and others. We've, we've also gained further support through programs like Horizon 2020 grants, as well as a first place finish in the world's largest unmanned aerial system accelerator, Genius New York. And we're currently closing our Series B uh, investment um, and uh, eager to grow our impact throughout public safety markets, helping those teams save lives and preserve property. Uh, thank you very much for, for the time. Sorry that the video um, didn't work, but uh, happy to answer any questions that you guys have. So Chris, if you're, I mean, I'll jump in. If um, it, Could you give us, you know, one or two case studies of, so, I mean, I get the, the high the high level idea, you got more information. Mm -hmm. um, what is it really that makes the difference? Sure. Uh, I, yeah. So a great a great example is um, a fire fire brigade recently showed up to a residential fire. Um, they got calls for it, and and the very first vehicle that showed up had a photokite. They were able to pop it up into the air, uh, get a quick visual, and it just hap just so happened that the incident commander who's looking at the tablet caught on the thermal camera that out the back door of this building that was on fire, the two people that were reported inside ran out the back door, hopped a fence, and were off. Now, this was seconds before that fire brigade sent three firefighters into that burning building, right? And so into an empty burning building. Now, this saves team resources. It also keeps those firefighters safe from going into an empty building that they were reported with two firefighters inside. So that aerial intelligence, that aerial information with the full context of the full scene, including on sides of the buildings that you're not necessarily seeing, really made a difference there. There's also situations like search and rescue where a uh, car crashes off the side of the road and somebody uh, either is ejected or uh, is you know confused, stumbles out of the vehicle and collapses somewhere. This has already been used several times to quickly identify where that person is but without a lengthy and labor intensive foot search, finding that person quicker to help uh, save their life and, and really, really accelerate that process. So we've been really motivated by applications like that and uh, we've, we've continued striving for those. Okay, and then uh, technically, uh, is is the drone essentially autonomous? Um, I mean, I don't have, or I don't have to fly it. It goes to a 
relatively fixed place. Yeah, that that's right. right. In fact, our core IP is really the ability for the system to fly 100% autonomously. So that's there's zero joysticks in the entire system. There's zero GPS dependency. Our system truly flies in closed loop form completely autonomously. That means that it can operate in GPS denied environments. It can be operated by anybody who's not a trained pilot. And that's why regulators have, uh, have given us those advantages. So that's really our core IP, which is patented and, and really, really lengthy. And then I assume I can point and zoom. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And it's, it's basically the exact same intuitive uh, operation like a smartphone, right? You're basically swiping or double tapping and our system is intelligent enough to snap and center on the object that you're uh, trying to focus on and stays right there. Okay. And then the economics, how, you know, what do you charge? You know, what do you cost? What are your margins? You know, yeah, as a, as a as a public as a public um, uh, competition, we don't really want to give margins away uh, publicly. But um, they, it is it is public safety space and and uh, industrial space, so margins are quite uh, both competitive and attractive. Uh, we do have this blended uh, business model where it's both uh, hardware as a service system sales as well as these software service offerings. Uh, it turns out that every single one of our customers that have a system end up adding on software service offerings, which increases our overall gross margin quite a bit down the line. Okay. And is there any, is there any ROI calculation? I mean, I, I get, you know, it's a good thing to save lives, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. but, I mean, but in, Absolutely. Terms, in terms yeah. of budget, you know, how do you convince, how do you, you know, in a world of limited budgets, this is another expense. What do they give up in order to buy you? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's a great question. Um, at the end of the day, uh, I think what's worth noting is in the public space safety space in particular, it started to look like more of a liability not to have aerial intelligence uh, than it is an opportunity. And so the market has really shifted as a macro level over the last two or two to five years uh, into this mindset of if you're not using drones, if you're not using all of the available tools that you can to get that contextual view, it's actually become more of a liability than anything else. So ROI is already really speaking for itself. Okay, and then you mentioned you've got, I think you said two plus 10 partners, 12 partners, I don't know, are they all in production contracts or are they pilots? So, to speak? Uh, so Supply and license contracts, yeah. So systems are getting shipped every single day and, and really used every single day. We hit some really neat milestones of uh, how many units were getting deployed uh, in you know thousands of missions per month recently, and, and we've been quite excited about that. Okay, but you're not going to give us the numbers because this is a public forum. That's right, right yeah. <laughs> hey, Chris, this is Jay. Um, just kind of, kind of following on Bill's question a little bit. I mean, um, a little bit of concern I would have is the public sector sale. It's, it's a very long sales cycle. Um, as Bill mentioned, you know, they have to give something up to buy you, mm -hmm. liability or whatever concern, you know. Body camera has been around for years and years. Uh, there was, a, you know, certain impetus that made that happen, right? And I'm wondering what's going to be that impetus that makes this a, you know, like you said, a, a liability, um, you know, maybe, maybe that is, but, um, um, you know, um, I guess what's, what's the impetus that make a public sale really buy you? And then how do you take care of the long sales cycle? Do you go through sure. uh, traditionals that work with these public sector companies? And so you're kind of um, selling to them or are you going direct or are you going to the manufacturers of these, you know, Oshkosh, for example, you mentioned, uh, what's right. your uh, go-to-market approach? Yeah, we're, we're really able to uh, kind of harness the tailwinds and, and headwinds of those megatrends like body cameras already, right? So people understand that that evidence locker and video uh, is really valuable to them already. Uh, in the use of those types of systems, they've identified that there are shortcomings, like only being able to show part of the story. And so the ability to go kind of one step further to this fully contextual view is very, very easy for them to understand. We do go through Axon, who is a body camera manufacturer and, and one of the main ones there. We do go through uh, Oshkosh and Pierce manufacturer. 
manufacturing as vehicle manufacturers, uh, the t systems tend to be very, very easy sells to customers because when they're spe specking out a $500,000 or $800,000 fire truck and they have one box to tick on, do I want aerial in intelligence built into this fire truck that I'm offering, it becomes a very easy way to, to uh, end up distributing these across the market. Um, same on the police market with these large contracts that get put together to deploy body cameras across an entire department. Uh, do you want some of your squad cars or uh, commander cars to be uh, uh, outfitted with this capability? The answer is, is almost and very easily yes. Maybe this is a similar question, but you know, what is the typical sales cycle? And uh, would you be would it be possible to share your thoughts on your target, you know, revenue in five years, and how many you know number number of customers you you know you should get in order to achieve that you know target revenue? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I can answer some of that. Our typical sales cycles really vary anywhere between three months and one year, depending on the department and and their purchasing and, and grant situation. Um, we have seen some shorter sales cycles, but those are really the outliers. So somewhere between three, three and 12 months is, is the typical there. Uh, in terms of, you know, revenue ramp, what we're on track for is kind of a 3x uh, year on year from from there. I won't give public information on what our revenue is right now, but it is quite attractive. And our Series B investors who are closing here in the next couple of weeks are quite uh, excited about it as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Christopher, for your presentation. Thank you. Uh Good to go. Uh, so next presenter is from Dot Incorporation, uh, who makes assistive devices to eliminate the information gap for the disabled people. Eric, please start. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm Eric, CEO of Dot. I studied in University of Washington, Seattle, major in social science and entrepreneurship. I'm also, uh, I, I had three startups before, and this is my fourth startups. And I'm also 30 under 30 Asia Social Entrepreneurs Forbes Fellows. Um, after I became Christian, when I studied in the US, I saw this Braille Bible book. It was so shocking to me because one tiny Bible book becomes 22 Braille Bible book after translation. Can you imagine what if we live in the world without the monitor? For 30 years, over 285 million visually impaired people needed the tactile monitor like this. But what's available right now is just a one simple one line of text available, Braille text available device with the cost over $30,000 to $5,000. And to achieve this full page tactile display, it's too expensive to achieve it. And there were so many fails, no one succeeded, like this EU funded government project, Anagras project. Finally, that made the 10 times smaller, lighter, and cheaper deep technologies. And with this, we created the dot pad. Dot pad gives the full opportunity for accessing all graphic materials for blind people with the standard format of Braille text. And right now, dot is the only one company can achieve this. So as you can see, this is ultimate technology like Macintosh first came out that en enables GUI for the first time with a much more affordable price. And not just the hardware, Dot Cloud is the most strongest AI engine to translate all text in 13 languages and tactile graphics onto the Dot Pad. This is a current worldwide method of teaching STEM education for blind students, very manual way. Because of our innovative technology, DOT has selected as an official technology supplier of the United States Department of Education from 2022 to 2026 to all in digitalize all the materials that's studying right now. Through our technology, now blind students and blind people can have more diverse job and diverse education. Every STEM education and coding physics, all subjects are possible. Moreover, we are also collaborating with Apple that enables more blind people to access iOS system. And not just Apple, we're also collaborating with Microsoft that enables Windows Office on our dot pad so that they can do more productive ways of work. Right now we are scaling up so fast 
with the US government approved technology. In 2021, we're gonna be in the standard model in five countries. And in, in 2023, we're gonna be in 30 countries standard model as a assistive device. We are in huge market, it's $20 billion market. And we believe in three years, we can scale up in 30 countries, include G20 countries, this over $2 billion of value. We have 114 patents globally to innovate this. And we are the passionate team of 32 people from top universities around the world and global companies like Samsung, LG, Nokia, and ServicePan with the over 20 years industry experiences. After DotPad, what's next? We are in $2,000 billion smart city market, very free IoT infrastructures with our core technology. Now that we have developed that display, we're expanding access to the world of images with it to the vision of barrier free mobility. The first step we have taken towards guaranteeing mobility rights for all is launching Dot Kiosk. Dot Kiosk? We're collaborating with Samsung Kiosk team and already over 100 customers. We are enabling the generations with the disabilities. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Eric. Over to you, judges, for your questions. Hi, this is uh, Zach here. Um, I mean, this looks pretty impactful. I'd just like to clarify where you're focusing either first or where's your area of expansion? Are you primarily B2C or do you see yourself as primarily B2B? Well, right now we are focusing on B2G area and also B2B. Uh, our first priority is secure the big contract with each government. So like what we did with the US Department of Education, uh, currently we also secure the co big contract with the South Korean government and also J Japanese government. And after this B2B contract is followed. So right now we are with the innovative technology, uh, you know, every government want to provide accessible tools uh, to make you know, graphic available for all, every blind students and every blind employees. So we are providing like this place right now with the B2G contract first and also B2B contract. Okay. And why did you start with your dot watch? Just that was your first product out there. Well, that was our MVP product. Thank you for asking that. Um, and also, you know, dot watch was the first braille smartwatch um, in the market. You know, at the time, Apple watch was like everywhere. So uh, we also, you know, made with our technology, we made the first wearable device for the blind people. And it was very successful. Um, you know, we've been featured in many, you know, medias and we sold more than 10,000 units, but it was B2C and it was very hard for us to focus on the B2C market as a, you know, like hardware and software, you know, both providers. So we uh, pivoted, you know, pivoted to the B2G market and B2B sectors and more valuable market. Uh, and we believe this is the PAD market. Got it, thank you. If I can jump in, uh, first I'd like to echo and say that this is really, uh, looks like a very impactful idea. Very, very impressive. Um, the question is around the barriers to entry. I mean, you mentioned that you have lots of patents, but you know, just looking at what you've shown in your presentation, it looks like something that you know, consumer, consumer electronics companies perhaps could easily copy, or I mean, let, let's say this is being adopted in the world. How do you protect your business? Well, you know, the, you know, the first one is obviously, thank you for a great question. Obviously it's the patent. And also, uh, you know, like I, you know, explained, we have, you know, in, for 30 years, like MIT, Stanford, and many companies actually try to innovate this market, but we are the, first one that actually succeeded to mass produce uh, with the affordable price and also 10 times smaller and uh, 10 times lighter size. So we have the most advanced technology and we are keep improving right now also. So I think the speed uh, from this advantage is the first one. And also, you know, we are, you know, we are, you know, working with the global patent firm also. So I think uh, securing patent is also very important to, uh, you know, secure our technology. But right now we are also, you know, very fast in the market. We are already working with the U.S. government, already working with Samsung and Apple and Microsoft. 
And our goal is in three years, we want to be in the standard technology in around the market. So after that, uh, I think all the standard and the UI will be us. So uh, we would like to become a small Apple in this market. Where do you produce this? Like, do you have like contract manufacturers? I mean, is it difficult to produce? Is it like, or, or the design? Well, you know, I think we got help from Samsung actually. We are working with one of the vendors from Samsung to ma you know, manufacture this kind of technology. Of course, uh, all the core technologies uh, manufacturing is here in South Korea. Uh, we are doing uh, by our own, you know, uh, and we, with and our own engineers. But, you know, for the mass productions of the dot pad, we're collaborating with one of the vendors of the Samsung. You know, uh, Erika, uh, could you say a few words about your content? How do you, you make sure there's enough content, as you say, in different language? Who is doing the content? How are you stimulating it? Thank you for the great questions. Actually, uh, like I show you on, you know, the, our, my, my slide, we have the AI engine right now that can translate all the text on the web and all the graphics on the webs. So basically what we are focusing on right now is you know, translating all the education materials for the US government. So all the K-12 uh, materials first and then you know, the university materials too. So right now we are in you know, gathering the data and we, you know, for the education sectors. And uh, after this, we're gonna expand this to the, you know, the vocation sectors. So, you know, we can, we, we are working with Microsoft and Apple and Samsung right now. So, um, you know, as more people using our devices, more uh, data will, you know, uh, aggregate it. Um, with like Apple and Microsoft, we are working with a few key software like PowerPoint, Excel, um, and Keynote, something like that. So uh, we're gonna provide, you know, the key software to the customers, but uh, also third party um, developers can develop uh, their app, their own app on our uh, platforms. So uh, it, it's like a it's like a Samsung and Apple's model. So, and what is the quality of the translation? Have you generated a lot of content so far, and how will you grade the quality of the translation? Well, we have right now the most accurate uh, translator uh, in the world, um, and that's why U.S. government uh, selected us as uh, official partners. We are exclusive partners, not just, we, we are not, we're not one of them. We are exclusive partners. We competed with over, you know, 20 companies for the, this $30 million contract and we won it. And we are the best uh, technology provider right now in hardware and software. So I think, and US government, you know, traditionally they made the, you know, worldwide standard uh, for this sector. And we think and we believe we're gonna be the next standard in this market, so that you know we can actually uh, change every you know paper materials and one line braille displays. Uh, you know it, it will be history, and we will be the future. So Eric, uh, I'd be very interested to know a little bit more about your prior startup experience, and also the a little bit more about the team that is behind the company. Well, thank you for the great question. Um, like I said, I had three startups. My last startup was called Wagon. I was a front-end uh, developer and, and co-founder. It was an Uber for truck. So in, in 2014, there was many startups like Uber for something. So we were um, one of them. But like what I felt was I wanted to do meaningful things because um, I really want to change the world as a student entrepreneurs and um, I, I found this problem when I visited the church uh, after I saw Braille Bible. And uh, after that, you know, just, um, you know, I, I follow my destiny, actually. So I, I came back to South Korea and I, I created this company, Dot. And after that, we went a lot of competitions to uh, pitch these ideas. And we actually won one of the Shark Tank in South Korea. It's called Pentagon. And after that, we uh, were kind of famous in South Korea. So we could actually hire many engineers uh, from Nokia and Samsung and LG. They want to participate with their shares. So uh, er, you know, early members from Samsung, Nokia, and like LG, those 
uh, great engineers, uh, you know, joined with visions and also we, I gave them shares, you know, so uh, we, so we could actually hire great engineers over experienced uh, 20 years. And um, right now we are a global team. So we have uh, our US team and also uh, expanding our sales uh, team right now. But in terms of senior leadership beyond yourself, would there be any folks in your team that you would cite as being leaders of the business with you that are helping to drive that success beyond the basic engineering? Well, it is it's kind of our secret sauce, but um, my father is actually very famous engineers in mechanical uh, engineers in South Korea. He worked for Nokia's and many uh, great companies to transform technologies uh, to China and many, many places. So, uh, you know, I could actually um, get very good network and also get my father's help uh, at, at the very first time because I was, uh, I had, you know, previously I had only uh, software uh, startup experiences. So this is my first hardware startup. So I could get a lot of help from him. But right now he's in our executive execu advisors and he's helping our team uh, with his, uh, people uh, with, with uh, engineers. He have, he has a lot of um, you know engineers fellows uh, behind him. So um, it's a, it's kind of our secret sauce, but we, so that we could actually secure core technology very well. Great. And one more question: as you as you contemplate actually turning some of these powerful relationships, like you know, Department of Education here in the U.S., to business. I mean, what is the routes to actually generating money for the company? In other words, are you looking for California school board to, to decide that, that this is going to become the, 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 uh, the device that gets used within the school system? Is it a government route still, or, or is the endorsement from the government a way that you, you have private buyers for your technology? Well, um, you know, Jack actually asked us about the watch. So we had the B2C product at first, but uh, you know, we're already in this market over five years. So we went a lot of, um, you know, uh, the seminars and a lot of, um, you know, the event exhibitions. So we could actually generate, you know, the initial network from them, from, from there. We, every year we bring, you know, the newest technology and great technology to the market. And we could actually uh, make, you know, great network through there. And uh, like, Two years ago, we could actually show to the US government our recent technology, our dotpad technology, and they were really fascinated. And they, what they said was, right now, it, it, it was 2000, uh, you know, 20, 2000, early 2020, they said they have the new project from the US government that they're gonna change, uh, you know, every like materials for, you know, student, blind students, they're gonna change to the digital way and they're looking for the technology. And you know the, this problem was for 30 years, many people tried to solve it and US government actually want to solve it uh, in actual level. So we applied that and we competed over one year and we could be selected as the official technology. And this, it, this, is, you know, this is a great achievement because you know, US education, you know, Department of Education has most powerful, um, you know, the you know, power to the market. So basically like every state, education department follow their um, roots. So we, we got the big one right now. So in next year, we're gonna be in California, we're gonna be in Europe, we're gonna be in, you know, uh, everywhere in, in the US, also like Canada, like North America. So we think right now we are at the edge of the changing. We are at the, of the big wave right now. Uh, it, we, we're gonna be the history changer. You know, I, I, I strongly believe that and in three years, um, around you know G20 countries, our technology will be used with so many students. I, I can guarantee that. Great, thank you. Um, just you. a question, just Eric. Just a question for me. Uh, so I, I'm trying to understand from a go-to-market approach. I understand it's B2B, B2G. Do you see yourself? making and building the end consumer product when you sell into the B2B or do you feel like the primary <clears throat> go-to-market strategy is going to be an OEM embedding your underlying core technologies into other uh, solutions that are existing out there and tagging on that with the team part of it is if you are going to be doing an, an OEM and an embedding strategy 
talk about your team or at least your thinking around the team that you feel like you need to put together from a go to market perspective. It sounds like you have a lot of strength in your engineering, but I'm really curious how you're thinking about leading the charge around driving the go to market with respect to your bundling and OEMing strategy as you kind of, you know, move the company forward. You know, thank you for the great question. Um, as you said, we have limited uh, resources. So um, our strategy was focusing on the big one, focusing on the big contract uh, as much as possible. That's why we focused on the US government contract. And um, you know, for you know, our go-to-market strategy is we actually build you know, end product. Uh, we were building product like Samsung or, or Apple. And we actually, you know, like Jack asked, we have an experience that provide the world first Braille smartwatch in the market. And that was sold in 20 countries worldwide. And also, like I said, we are working with Samsung for manufacturing uh, so that we could actually have a premium um, manufacturing power uh, in our company right now. So uh, right now, uh, unfortunately, there's not many uh, companies can produce, uh, you know, like, like, like this kind of things, you know, our, our dot path. So right now we are making we already made the device and we, we show it to the US government and then they choose us. And right now, what we are focusing on is mass productions. Uh, we are, that's why we are raising right now uh, to the, uh, you know, uh, South Korean uh, investors and the worldwide investors right now, we're about to do the mass productions and we already succeeded in mass productions before. So for us, it's not a, a big problem in, uh, you know, we, we we already have a really strong, you know, team for that. So we are making end product, um, and uh, our go-to-market strategy was focusing on the big contract. So followed by the U.S. government punch contract, we're you know focusing on the Japanese government contract, South Korean government contract, and the EU government contract. So we are uh, with the U.S. government contract. We are uh, you know showing to the other government, uh, you know, education department that we our technology and you know, this deal, it actually kind of followed by, uh, you know, followed by that deal. So, um, and also we, we, we are also lack of many sales force right now. That's why we are raising and uh, we are only 32 people. So with, with after this round, we're gonna increase our uh, sales member over 30 people. So um, we are rapidly moving to the, uh, global market. Okay, any other questions for Eric? Good, thank you, last Eric. Question, uh, last question, Eric. Uh, do you yes. see over time uh, the value of your company to be more on the AI automatic transition software or the hardware? How do you see the balance, at least from an R&D investment standpoint? Where, uh, you, let's say five years down the road, where are you going to put the most uh, uh, $100. Well, I think our in our core technology is like I showed to you. Our core technology is, um, you know, the display technology. So uh, we're gonna keep making the most more accurate and more uh, density uh, display technology, like tactile display technology. This is actually haptic technology. So we have our own lab, and we have most experienced uh, engineers uh, in in South Korea. So this is the one part that we're gonna focus, display technology, haptic technology. And the second one is our software. Uh, we need to create the platform right now and platform is about to begin with the great collaboration with big companies and the US government. So we're gonna focus on two things, display technology and the uh, platform, uh, making platform a uh, little Apple, little Samsung uh, in, in, in our uh, product roadmap. All right, great judges. And thank you, Eric from DOT. Thank you. And now moving on to our last presentation today, uh, please welcome Wasteless, uh, an AI inspiration analytics or expiration analytics to reduce food waste at retailers. Thank you, Victoria. Is this, are you seeing yeah. my screen? Yes, I'm seeing your screen. Great. 
great. So, so I'm Tomas, I'm from Wasteless. So one third of the food produced today in the world is never eaten. So when we see how this waste goes, we see that almost half of it happens at supermarkets. And this is not only bad for the planet, but also for retailers, which usually throw away up to 8% of perfectly edible food concentrated mostly on the perishable and fresh categories. So who's to blame about this? Expiration dates. We, as consumers, tend to always choose the product with a longer expiration date, even when we know our intention is to consume it within a day or two. There is no rational incentive to choose a product with a shorter date, as the prices are usually the same. The solution to this problem is Wasteless. Wasteless allows supermarkets to price and sell products based on their freshness. Using AI, our pricing engine continually monitors the shelves and delivers the best markdown for each expiration date depending on the risk of each item of being wasted. So consumers are rewarded to make a sustainable purchase, helping retailers minimize their loss. How does it work? First of all, traditional barcodes are replaced by data-enabled barcodes to include the expiration date, applied either in store or at food suppliers so that checkouts can recognize the expiration of each item. Um, then the point of sale interacts with the pricing engine, while consumers are able to see these eventual discounts with electronic shelf labels, e-commerce platforms, or mobile apps. The technology behind uses reinforcement learning to track sales patterns, taking into account over 43 factors such as supply, demand, time of the day, or elasticity of each customer toward freshness. The algorithm gets this information and determines for each expiration date whether to apply a discount or not, and by how much, learning and improving its performance over time. Now, the good news is that it actually works. For example, in Spain and in Italy, stores were able to reduce up to 40% of waste while increasing revenues and product margins. Our patented solution is currently the only one that uses expiration dates and AI to prevent waste from happening at the first place, while other players are following a more traditional and reactive approach towards the, the food waste issue. We charge retailers an initial setup fee per store and a monthly fee per product that is tracked by our pricing engine. Our strategy to accelerate adoption of our technology has been usually uh, pre-integrating with the biggest point of sale companies while building also an ecosystem of system integrators and key retail players. Also, we are very proud to announce uh, our upcoming project with Metro, one of the, um, the largest uh, retailers in Europe, where we will hopefully launch in the next few weeks. We have a global team of engineers and data scientists that have been working with data analytics and also in acquired uh, retail software companies. And finally, we are currently raising 4 million to complete our Series A in order to release the third version of our pricing engine and scale up our sales team. So Wasteless offers a triple win solution. We help supermarkets sell more. We give uh, customers uh, the opportunities to save money while helping to build a more sustainable future for our planet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tomas. Over to the judges' questions. Yes, Thomas. Um, what what percentage of the of a supermarket SKUs uh, do you think it will cover normally? Yes, as I said, uh, we are mainly focused on fresh categories, which are the ones that are at higher uh, risk of waste, which are usually also uh, mostly wasted. Uh, on average, this accounts for about twenty percent of of each supermarket. So. Uh, it could be less depending on, on the store. Maybe the neighborhood stores are more likely to have a higher percentage of fresh items and more like uh, hyper markets have a, 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 smaller, um, a smaller number of SKUs. But on average, we are uh, expecting to have per store uh, about 200 to 500 SKUs, okay, that we are tracked and that we are optimizing its prices. Um, yeah. I, I'm in my experience, uh, a, a regular supermarket has between 30 and 60,000 SKUs. Uh, 500 SKUs is not a 20% of that. So 
Right. Yes. That. I mean, that's I, I, this all goes to the pricing because when I saw the pricing, it's like that's much too expensive. I mean, if you're planning to to pay ten thousand times five point eight dollars per <laughs> month per store, that's a lot. Yes, it's not about the price, it's about how much you save. So based on our experience, the, the, the return on investment was uh, between three months to 12 months. Depends a lot on how much uh, data we can fit the, the algorithm. And of course, the, the previous waste, depending on the operation of the store. And also regarding the number of SKUs, we expect to have between 200 and 500 in the short term. And the reason for this is mainly because we have one very uh, strong limiting factor that, that uh, kind of limits our scale, which is that many items have the, the barcode uh, that is printed on suppliers, uh, which is also printed on the package, okay? Uh, our items, the, the items that we work with, which are more likely that we can easy, easily change this barcode from supplier or from uh, in-store, are those that have, uh, have a printed label, okay? That's why in the short term, we expect to have that number of SKUs. In the future, we, we expect actually to have 60,000 SKUs and not only the perishable items, but also apply the pricing engine to products that are not necessarily food, but also any kind of product because the overstock on out of stock pro, uh, problem can also be solved by uh, dynamic pricing, okay? Thank you. Hi, Thomas. Um, well, first of all, it, it's quite an interesting premise and in, in a way, you know, just very simply leveraging kind of the power economics to create, you know, I'm in an incentives. Um, so my, my question is like, what is preventing maybe some of these larger retailers from developing their own system? I mean, they have access to all of their POS data kind of, um, and, and once they cap or get onto this idea of, you know, dynamic pricing, you know, do you, do you fear that one day, a lot of these players will just develop their own systems. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, in fact, uh, it's funny because they tried to, to build one and they failed. One of uh, one large uh, retailer, which actually has a more like technological approach. But the, the thing is that retailers are not tech companies and they are not data companies. In fact, one of the, the first impressions we get when we get on a store is like, we feel that you are selling a, like a, a rocket to, to Mars when they are actually trying to migrate from Windows 98 to Windows 7. So it's kind of like uh, they are more focused on selling and more like in, a, in an old fashioned way, way. That's why they are not uh, that likely to, to generate this by their own because you need like a team that, is, that has a, a data background. And we actually did that in, in previous startups. We work with data a analytic company, Beverage, uh, actually pricing engine for Beverage, um, the Beverage industry. So it's kind of like they could do it because they have the, the capital to do, but it, it will be way faster and easier to just um, uh, get it from, from outside. Hi, Tomas, this is Leone. What is the onboarding process for a, a supermarket and how, how much time is required to actually maintain one SKU? Sorry, the last part I missed. How much time is required for them to maintain and update a SKU or multiple SKUs? Okay, so if, first of all, what we do is we ask for the previous data, historical data, and that we feed to the to the pricing engine, and then we get um, a soft integration with the point of sale, which could take between three days to two months, depending on how willing they what they want to open their IT teams. Okay, so that's one part, and then for the pricing engine itself, it works auto automatically and on, on its own. So you just you can set up some kind of a, a, uh, characteristics, for example, how many times you want the pricing engine to change during the day or some kind of uh, different uh, things like that. But actually, it's like a, a closed box solution that they just install it and then run it and then they can see how it's performing. Okay. I don't know if I answered your last question or not sure if I understood correctly. 
Oh, sorry. So I'm just wondering if someone, so I used to, uh, I was part of the team that built out Whole Foods East store and we were looking at hundreds and thousands of SKUs and it took a lot of time to go through them. So I'm just wondering um, if Whole Foods was perhaps one of your customers, uh, how much time would they need a liaison basically or like a representative from their team to engage with you uh, in order to manage each of these SKUs on a daily basis as they continue to turn out other products? Okay, on average, we, we take between one month to three months between we start the, we say, okay, we sign the, the contract and we start working. In fact, for example, Whole Foods may be even faster because they are more like, uh, they are, for example, they already have in some stores electronic shelf labels, which that's something that can accelerate because they are already familiar with how it works. Although we can also provide the ESLs, the electronic shelf labels, and that's something pretty straightforward. But I would say on average, one to three months. Uh, of course, depending on the number of stores and depending on how much uh, willing they want to, to make it happen, okay? Okay, thank you. Thanks. Any other questions? Great, thank you, Tomas, for your presentation. So as we move to a decarbonized world, we require huge volumes of metals like nickel, copper, and cobalt. For example, each electric vehicle will require four times more copper over an internal combustion engine. Renewable energy sources in wind power and in solar also require substantial quantities of copper. And then there is network distribution and storage to consider. For copper alone, there is a projected deficit of 10 million tons by 2030. This is equivalent to eight times the production of the world's largest copper mine. Geoscience Australia, a public sector body, has identified that in Australia alone, there are 2 million tons of copper, 2.5 million tons of nickel, and 250,000 tons of cobalt that are marginally sub-economic with current technology. These resources, worth around $70 billion, are considered viable with a technology shift. Globally, this extrapolates to a massive $400 billion worth of energy metals available for tomorrow's electrification and decarbonization. Our solution unlocks these marginal resources using glycine leaching technology. It not only offers a substantial reduction in the economic cost allowing these ores to become viable, but also addresses a range of environmental and social issues associated with more traditional mining. Glycine is the key reagent in MPS's smart chemistry. It allows for the selective dissolution of valuable targeted metals and is an effective alternative to toxic chemicals such as sulfuric acid and cyanide. Critically, glycine does not dissolve valueless gang minerals. Unlike sulfuric acid and cyanide, glycine is not consumed in the process and so can be recycled and reused. This is the source of glycine's unique cost advantage. The ability to turn previously non-viable deposits into viable glycine opportunity gives us a competitive advantage. It underpins a conservative total available market, or TAM, of greater than $1 billion. This has been derived from identifying specific acid-consuming geological deposits that are suitable for our technology. Glycine is a simple amino acid that is naturally present in the human body. It is produced in pharmaceutical grade like this, Don't try this with sulfuric acid. <laughs> it is non-toxic um, and, and available in bulk. We have already de-risked the process to successive testing and development stages. MPS is now ready to progress this technology to large scale implementation. We expect to derive value from multiple revenue sources that include license and service fees with major mining companies, chemical sales royalties, and earning into equity in projects that use our technology. A current ARR of $2 million per annum is expected to rise to $10 million per annum in three years and over $20 million within five years. 
We have solid industry validation with over $8 million spent to date by mining companies in testing and piloting the technology for candidate ores. As a result, we have executed six licenses with potential users and have seven advanced projects. We have a strong patent portfolio and have established initial channels to market. Our award-winning team consists of well-seasoned industry executives that have experience in developing mining service businesses. We also have a strong technical team passionate about next generation mining solutions. MPS, unlocking stranded metals to accelerate a sustainable tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Ivor. Hi, Ivor. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to some of your current licensees and what um, mining purposes they're using your bison for. Okay, so we, we have um, six advanced uh, projects that are piloting and demonstration phase. And, and in fact, one is pre-commercial. Three of them are, are uh, overseas and three of them are in Australia. Um, a few of them are, are based on retreating of previously mined tailings, so they're waste from the previous mining operations. And because of our economies due to use of glycine, we can uh, retreat those and, and generate uh, metals from them. Uh, so about four of them are, are targeted at, at uh, retreatment of, of what we call tailings. Um, and the other, the other uh, projects are, are more at uh, existing operations and, and retrofitting the technology to those operations. Thank you. Uh, I should say we, we've got, we're actually working with, with three of the largest mining operations in Australia currently. Leone or Giancarlo, do yeah. you have any questions? Yeah, I was wondering what, what's the, the I mean, if, if a company like BHP or another mining company in Australia is using it, what's their, um, let's say, delta in, uh, let's say, increased yield or increased recovery rate? Are, are we talking about something incremental or it's uh, it could be a game changing, uh, let's say, technology in terms of advantages for them? I think it, our, our initial target market is, is very focused on, on those um, deposits that are uh, currently considered marginal. And, and I guess um, high priority on those deposits are those deposits that are uh, asset consumers. Um, generally, if they're, if they're actually hosted in, in a limestone rock, then, then traditional technology uh, using sulfuric acid just isn't viable. So, um, we are working with uh, some of those companies, those large companies, on some of these stranded deposits and new deposits, but but less so on on the existing operations. Okay, thanks. Leonie, do you have a question? No, I, I read through the, the deck, so everything looks great to me. And thank you for the other judges who asked. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you, Ivor from Mining Process Solutions. Thank you.